Um, teaching on Wednesday nights is moving. We are still at Sacred Heart School, but we are moving to a room that is significantly bigger. It's just past the room that we've been using, so it'll be easy to find. So if you haven't been coming out regularly there because it's just been a little inconvenient at times in the small room, uh, we hope you'll join us again as we can certainly accommodate everybody now. And uh, finally, just want to say that we do appreciate your being careful as you enter the driveway and as you're using the parking lots. We very much appreciate all of your patience and all of your prayers and all of your giving towards phase two. It's a lot of fun uh, to see that come together. So we just appreciate your standing with us together in prayer for phase two. All right, Romans chapter eight, and I'm going to re begin reading at verse one. Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. One of the best loved chapters in the entire Bible. And the Apostle Paul is describing for us some incredibly powerful truths. The title of my message today is Sons and Daughters of the Living God. Sons and Daughters of the Living God. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to help us as we look into the Word of God this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the beautiful name of Jesus, the name that opens heaven's door to your people. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. It is truly the lamp for our feet, and it's the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we pray that you would touch our hearts right now in these next few minutes, that our hearts would be good soil, soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus, you said that the words you speak to us, they are spirit and they are life. So, Lord, would you send your spirit to minister that life to us now? If you agree with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen? Well, we've had a bit of a break from the book of Romans, but as we jump back into it today, we are reaching one of the high points. In fact, we're entering one of the best known and best loved chapters in the entire Bible. In Romans 8, Paul is going to sum up all of his teaching so far. He's also going to give us an uplifting vision of how we can live a victorious life in Christ. He's going to tell us how God enables us to live as overcomers. In order to understand Paul's presentation of these great truths, we need to step back and just take a couple of minutes to review where we've been so far in Romans. 
Within the first chapters, Paul spoke about our greatest need, and that's the need to be justified. Every human being, no matter their background, needs to be forgiven of sin and then declared righteous by God. We've gone astray from God, and so we need to be put back in right standing with him. It's our greatest need. In chapter 3, we saw that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is that God has made a way for us to be justified, and all of us, every one of us, can become a part of God's family. In chapter 4, Paul talks about how we're justified. We can't be justified by our religious background or by our good deeds, but rather we're justified by faith in Christ, faith in the God who wants to show mercy to the undeserving. Paul explained how God will credit to our account a righteousness that we could never have earned ourselves. We saw how Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Then moving on into chapter 5, Paul turned a corner there. He began to explore the blessings that come to those who've been justified by faith. What do we receive? We receive peace with God, access to his grace, and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 6 and 7, Paul addressed the struggles we face as we seek to live these truths out. Pastor Glenn shared how we can enjoy the beautiful freedom of slavery to God because we are no longer slaves to sin. We're also free from the demands of religion. Religion is about what I have to do, but living in Christ is about what he has done for me. And now we're divorced from religion. You remember a few weeks ago we all got divorced? We're divorced from religion, and so we're free to pursue a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And now as we turn into chapter 8 this morning, you can sense Paul's excitement as he reaches the great climax of all of his rhetoric, of all the arguments that he's been making. He's finished all of his hypothetical debates with enemies of the gospel. He has proven what he set out to prove all the way back in chapter 1 when he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So now in chapter 8, Paul gets to cut loose. And in 39 marvelous verses, he's going to explore the greatness of a victorious Christian life. He's going to share how Jesus gives us victory in the here and now. He gives us hope for today, and he gives us hope for eternity. Paul changes focus now in his teaching. He's going to center on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Jesus said that when the Spirit came, he would take the things of Jesus and reveal them to us. And Paul here is going to show us a little bit of what that means. He's going to show us how the Spirit helps us to overcome in our daily living. How the Holy Spirit helps us because we've become the children of God. Up until now, Paul's been giving us a lot of deep theology concerning the Father's plan and the cross of Christ. How many of you would agree that some of what we've seen in Romans, it's a little deep, isn't it? Paul's taught us in detail how the Father and the Son brought the gospel into the world in a kind of holy conspiracy to bring salvation to mankind. But now in chapter 8, Paul's going to talk about living out that salvation in the power of the Spirit of God. Why has this chapter been a favorite for so many people? I think it's because here we can see this great sunburst of the Holy Spirit, taking all the truths that we've learned so far and making them come alive. We see the Spirit of God becoming our partner in this daily adventure of growing in Christ and experiencing His love. Let me just say that whenever we see the Spirit at work and being mentioned so much, we shouldn't think from that that the Father and the Son are not working together with Him. You know that all three persons of the Trinity are always planning and always working together in harmony for your good. So let's not misunderstand what I'm saying, but Romans 8 is a little different. It's as if Paul were saying, now that you've learned about the gospel of Christ, let me show you what it means to have a share in it. Let me show you how the Spirit's going to make it real to you. 
You know, in Romans 7, starting at the beginning of the book, all the way up through chapter 7, Paul only uses the word spirit five times in those seven chapters. But in the passage we just read to you this morning, Paul refers to the Holy Spirit 15 times in just 17 verses. Paul wants to blow your mind by showing you that all along your Christian journey, in many different ways, the Spirit of God is going to be your constant companion, encouraging you and teaching you how to experience the abundant life that Jesus promised us. Amen. Now, I'm sure that many of us have studied, you've studied the supernatural gifts of the Spirit, and you've probably also read about the many other wonderful ministries that Jesus says the Spirit has for us. But in this passage, Paul is discussing, he's summarizing life in the Spirit from a little bit different angle. He's focusing on how the Holy Spirit helps you because you are a child of God. In our passage, there are six different ways the Holy Spirit helps us, and I'm going to share them with you quickly. And when I say quickly, I promise. Six ways the Spirit helps the sons and daughters of God to live in victory. And the first one is this. The Holy Spirit sets us free. The Holy Spirit sets us free. Paul says in verse 1 and 2, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. One of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. But as we read that, I think we seldom ask the question, why is Paul saying therefore? What does that therefore mean there? Well, church, this therefore is Paul's great conclusion to everything he has said up to this point. Paul is saying, in the light of everything I've taught you so far, and because of what God says all along the letter about justification and righteousness coming to you and grace coming to you, because of all those good things that God has done, there is therefore no condemnation for you now. If you're in Christ, there is no possibility of being condemned. Amen. Four of you were excited about that. <laughs> Praise God. I just wanted to make sure that the service hadn't let out early and nobody told me. Praise the Lord. But if you're in Christ, there is no possibility of being condemned. If we are justified, then we cannot be rejected again by God, assuming that we continue on in his grace. Paul says there's no condemnation now. Everybody say now. now. Being saved in Christ, you see, is not just for going to heaven. It's more than just your ticket to a good afterlife. It means that believers get to live today Already, say already. already, already with God's acceptance and with God's smile. You don't become a son of God or a daughter of God when you die. You don't receive eternal life when you pass away someday. If you're in Christ, you have God's favor, God's life. You have God's seal of acceptance now. Paul says there's no condemnation, but why is that the case? Well, here he summarizes what he's been writing all the way through. It's because the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. See, the law of sin and death is driving and pushing fallen humanity. It's driving our fallen flesh. As we've seen all along in Romans, it energizes the power of sin within us. And we saw just a few weeks ago in chapter 7, it makes us do the very thing that we don't want to do. But now we've come under another law, the law of the spirit of life. The Holy Spirit keeps me. He's at work within me to empower me so that I can please God. He frees me from the guilt that comes when I'm trying to please God and trying to live in my own strength. Paul says the law can't help us walk in the spirit because it's weak through the flesh. In other words, you know what's wrong with the law? It's me. Our flesh is what makes the law weak. And so we need to find a different way to live and please God. Thank God, Paul says, that Jesus died so that the righteous demands of the law would be fulfilled in me. 
They're fulfilled in us when we walk in the spirit and not according to the flesh. See, when we walk in the spirit, the spirit will tell us to do the right thing. He'll lead us to do the right thing. He'll empower us to do the right thing. And when that happens, we will fulfill what the law requires. We will do what is pleasing to God. Our lives are governed now by a higher law, one in which we work in partnership with God instead of being judged by God. This is how he sets us free from condemnation. And we can yield our members to him now to serve righteousness instead of serving sin and reaping a harvest of frustration. How does the Spirit help us live in victory? First, by setting us free. And second, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. In verse 9, Paul says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. This is the great truth that makes it possible for us to walk in the Spirit. We don't know the Spirit from afar off. We don't experience Him as a mere influence acting on us from the outside. But instead, He has come to live inside the children of God. And this is so much the mark of believers in Christ that Paul is compelled to say it very bluntly. If the Spirit is not living inside you, you don't even belong to Jesus Christ. Come on, say it with me. Greater is He who is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus said, you know the Spirit because He dwells with you and He shall be in you. This is the great gift of God to the believer, so underappreciated that we have the greater one living inside us. There are so many wonderful truths, of course, that are contained in that doctrine, and we certainly can't stop to dig into them this morning. But Paul's concern here is to show us how the Spirit helps us not to walk in the flesh. And he explains that our task as believers, our part in this, is to make sure that we are setting our minds on the things of the Spirit. Beginning at verse 5, he says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. It produces a harvest of life and peace for you when you set your mind on the things of the Spirit. What does it mean to set your mind on something? The well-known pastor and author John Stott explained it like this. Listen, he says, it's a question of what preoccupies us, of the ambitions which drive us, and the concerns which engross us how we spend our time and our energies, what we concentrate on and give ourselves up to. All this is determined by who we are, whether we're still in the flesh or now by new birth in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Where we set our minds will set our course, and our course will determine our destiny and our happiness. Are we thinking at all on the things of the Spirit? Because that's the only way to experience life and peace. Paul goes on to say in verse 10, If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, in other words, you have this body of death of a sinful nature, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. See, our mortal body of sin can't help but push us in the direction of sin. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so Paul says that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But because we've been made righteous by God, listen, God has caused his spirit to dwell within us. And what's the blessing we derive from that? Well, that means that he's a constant presence now and a constant voice in my heart. When we're tempted, he gives me loving warnings. When I stumble, he's a loving voice of conviction. And at all times, he's a constant source of encouragement and power. Because the spirit dwells within me, he helps me live in victory over the flesh. 
because we've been declared righteous by God, he ministers life to me even though I still have a body of sin to contend with. Six ways the Spirit helps us live in victory. He sets us free from condemnation. He helps us walk in the Spirit through his indwelling. And third, the Holy Spirit gives us hope of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit gives us hope of the resurrection. In verse 11, Paul says, If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Now, you know, in other places, Paul compares the gift of the Spirit to a deposit and to an engagement ring. So church, get this. God's presence, the Spirit's presence in our lives is wonderful now already. But just like an engagement ring, the Spirit living with us today is also the guarantee that something even better is on the way. If God raised up Jesus, he will raise you up as well. You see, the love of God that you feel in your heart, the power of God that you feel in your spirit that helps you overcome temptation, that's not a temporary thing. The presence of the spirit in your life is not just for this earth. Didn't Jesus say, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you? No, God's going to keep bringing you from glory to glory to glory to glory. <laughs> Until one day, even this mortal body will one day be transformed by the spirit of glory who lives within us. You know, I'm going to show my age right here, but it is not a fashionable thing to sing about that and talk about that anymore. You know, we don't sing, I'll fly away anymore. <laughs> or when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. We don't sing, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we can or should turn back the clock. But church, we do need to think a little more about the resurrection from the dead. We need to think about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to think about how we're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We need to think about being raised to life incorruptible. That's our hope. Church, we are so attached, too attached to the things of this world. I think a Christian ought to think about eternity every day. This must be the only generation in the whole history of the church where a person who talks about heaven is considered to be unspiritual. To when we celebrate communion together in a few minutes, the word says we're proclaiming his death until he comes. See, we're supposed to have that in mind all the time. It'll do something for you. The spirit wants us to think about where we're headed, even while he's helping us navigate life in the here and now. God will one day give life to our mortal bodies through the spirit who already lives inside us. And that gives us hope. It gives us a hope that nothing else can, even in the face of tragedy and loss. There's something better coming. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And God says that one day he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. You hear my heart, church? We ought to think about that so much more than we have been in recent times. The Spirit helps us by giving us hope of the resurrection. The fourth way the Spirit helps us to live a victorious life is this. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. He sanctifies us. In verse 13, Paul tells us, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. He makes us holy. Now, we already saw that setting the mind on the things of the flesh will produce a harvest of death. But here, Paul talks about the problem of sin from a different angle. He says we must put to death the deeds of the body by the spirit. And Paul's using some very strong language here. The word that he uses there in the Greek actually does mean to kill someone. It can mean to hand somebody over to death 
by execution. And there's some important things here we need to think about. First, Paul is not saying that the body is the enemy. How many of you know that scripture teaches us that the body is a good thing that's made by God, right? The scripture says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And over the centuries, though, some have kind of taken these words and gone with them in a wrong direction and, and believed that the body is evil or even believed that they should physically punish their bodies as a way to fight against sin. And this is not at all what Paul is saying. I want you to notice that Paul says it's the deeds of the body which are evil and which must be put to death. So all of the inclinations that you and I have to misuse our hands, our eyes, or any other part of our bodies must be stopped. And we need to approach this with such a sober commitment to overcome that Paul can only compare it to being put to death. The second, and this goes right along with that, it's not within our own power to defeat sin. Paul says we must do it by the Spirit. Human willpower can't do it. If you don't believe that's true, I give you some homework today. I want you to go out there and see if you can be nice for a month. <laughs> Catch up with me at Thanksgiving. Let me know how you did. Now, church, we may not, of course, like the consequences of sin, of what it brings. But as Paul pointed out in chapter 7, left to our own, without the aid of the Spirit, we are unable to keep from doing the very things that we hate. But thank God the Holy Spirit can help. You see, filling ourselves with His presence, being in His Word, being in prayer, being in worship will enable us to better yield ourselves to His voice, to His will, to His power. As Paul stated, setting our minds on the things of the Spirit will bring a harvest of life and peace. And if we're walking with him, if we're asking for his help instead of indulging with sin, he will help us. It's only right for us to pursue holiness in this way. For one thing, Paul says here that we have a debt. Not a debt to the flesh, but a debt that we owe to Christ. It's a debt of gratitude. And that's why just a little ways further on in Romans 12, Paul is going to say that presenting our bodies to God as a living sacrifice is our reasonable service. In colloquial English today, we might just say, in other words, it's the least we can do. After all, he's done for us. It just makes sense. By the help of the Spirit, we can live right. And there's also a good reward that's promised when we put these misdeeds of the body to death. Paul says, you will live. Now, don't misunderstand what he's saying here. This doesn't mean that you have to put the deeds of the body to death in order to be justified. You already were justified by faith in Christ, not because you conquered sin. In fact, it's faith in Christ that will actually empower you to overcome sin. But Paul says there's a release of life there. When we overcome, there's a deeper experience of life and spiritual satisfaction. How many of you know that there's a deeper release of joy that you experience in your life when you know that you've brought pleasure to God's heart? Amen. See, when you are used by somebody, when you're used by the world or betrayed by a person, it doesn't feel too good. But when the Lord uses you, when he works together with you and you know you've been used by God to do his will and purpose, it feels good, doesn't it? It brings a release of joy to your heart. So church, let's present our members to him as instruments of righteousness. Let's set our minds on the things of the spirit and experience real living. The Holy Spirit helps us to live a victorious life by sanctifying us. Okay, six things the Spirit does to help us live victorious, and we're up to number five. The Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit leads us. In verse 14, Paul is continuing on with this idea of becoming holy. So he says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Church, listen, God doesn't lead the people of the world who don't know him. He only trains his own sons and daughters. In fact, the Bible says that that is actually one of the true marks of sonship. 
If we truly are his children, the Holy Spirit will lead us. Now, in context here, Paul is not really talking about how the Spirit gives us wisdom and helps us to make good decisions and so on, although, of course, obviously the Spirit does do that. But actually, what Paul's talking about here is the Spirit leading us into holiness as we seek to put to death the misdeeds of the body. Now, it is Sunday morning, after all, so it's okay if I preach to you for a minute. <laughs> all right, now listen. Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. But nowadays, I'm afraid with some saints, it seems like some of us are praying, Lord, lead me not into the water when I'm skating on thin ice. <laughs> Let's not tempt the Lord. See, when we're in temptation, how many of you know the Bible says God will make a way of escape? Yes. Ask him to lead you to that way of escape. Usually the best way to escape is not to start going down that questionable path in the first place. I'm sure Pastor Glenn will have more to say on this as he takes us deeper into chapter 8. But let me say this. The Holy Spirit's name is the Holy Spirit. He won't lead you into sin. Now this may not apply to you, but you wouldn't believe what people say to us as pastors. The Holy Spirit won't lead you into unbiblical behavior. Listen, he won't lead you to places where the name of Jesus Christ is defiled. And he won't lead you into relationships where there's going to be pressure put on you to do ungodly things. That wasn't him. He didn't lead you there. See, my Bible says he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me in paths of what? Righteousness for his name's sake. I'll just leave it there. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps us by leading us. So let's listen for his voice as he's seeking to lead us. Six ways the Spirit helps us to live a victorious life. And the last one is this. The Holy Spirit gives us assurance. The Holy Spirit gives us assurance. Starting at verse 15, Paul says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then we're also heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. Worship team, please come back if you would. The Holy Spirit helps me to live victoriously by giving me assurance of who I am in Christ. Church, I wonder what would happen if we meditated on that truth, that you are in Christ. You know, it's a powerful little statement. It's one that is found sprinkled all over the New Testament epistles. Just do a search for those powerful little phrases, in Christ or in Him and meditate, learn those verses, meditate on those verses that talk about what you are and what you have in Christ and in him. It will change your life. You see, the world, the flesh, the devil, maybe even a couple of your friends are really good at reminding you who you're not. But God says, let me tell you who I think you are. Because who I think you are is who you are. And who I say you're going to be is who you're going to be because you're in my son. Paul says you're not going to shrink back into slavery because you've been adopted. You're a son. You're a daughter of the living God. And you have received the spirit of adoption who was sent to tell you that. He's the Holy Spirit who comes and testifies to your heart on the inside that God has welcomed you and adopted you. The fact that you know God as your dad, as your Abba, means that you've become a part of his household. Paul says it's only because the Spirit's inside of you that you can even say that in the first place. 
If you don't think that that's true, then I would invite you to think back to a time before you really knew the Lord. See, before you knew God, you didn't think that way about him or feel that way about him by nature, that he was your daddy, that he was your Abba. And you couldn't say that about him. The Spirit is bearing witness inside you that you're His child. And you're not just His child. You're His heir. And He's not taking you out of the will. Listen, you are not the weird, out-of-town relative that God simply has to tolerate at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And God is not some medieval sultan with 800 kids that he doesn't know by name. No, you are precious to him. Paul says, you're so special to God that you get to inherit everything together with Jesus. You are a co-heir together with the one that he made it all for in the first place. So this morning, as you've come in here, are you feeling a little down about yourself these days, maybe? Do you sometimes feel like you're spinning your wheels and you're not getting anywhere in life? Do you even feel maybe like the best is behind you now? Don't believe it. You ought to read Romans 8 over and over again every day. Every day read it until some of these truths get down in your spirit and you get encouraged in your soul. You can live a victorious life and you can get through anything if only you become convinced of God's great love for you and the marvelous things that he's preparing for you right now. You are a joint heir. You are a fellow heir with Jesus Christ of all things. So how does the Spirit help us to live a victorious life in Christ. He sets us free. He lives within us. He gives me hope of the resurrection. He sanctifies me and he leads me in the path of holiness. He helps me remember that God is my father. He reminds us that we are sons and daughters of the living God. Come on, stand together with me. Let's give Jesus praise in his hand.